So we are sitting with Stephen Bess of the Rockville English Department. Thank you very much for coming out today to do this interview with us. And thank you for inviting me. This is such an honor. Thank you so much. So let's get started by you telling me a little bit about your educational and professional background and your experiences. Well, um, after graduating high school, I, I actually didn't start my education at that point. I went to the Navy um, straight out of high school because I didn't want to go to college in Georgia. So I went into the Navy. I did my uh, three years. And after getting out of the Navy, I decided I wanted to go to uh, college of all places in Georgia. <laughs> so I ended up going to college in Georgia anyway. So in 1989, spring of 1989, I enrolled at uh, Savannah State College at the time, uh, HBCU in Savannah, Georgia, and uh, didn't know my major either. I thought I was going to study communications because I was good at radio, um, and I thought that would be my major. But then I became interested also in English because that was my favorite subject in high school. So I decided to do English major and mass communications minor. And so I, I, I worked at the radio station, both on campus and off campus, all through college, and was an English major. And I loved it. You know, that was just my, my thing. Um, I loved literature. And um, that, that seemed like the path to go. I didn't know what type of job I was going to get because I didn't think I was going to go into teaching. Um, at least I didn't have plans at the time, but uh, <laughs> I, I, of course I ended up teaching. Here you are, and here I am. Yeah. So, uh, nineteen ninety eight began my teaching career, I believe. Yeah, nineteen ninety eight. Cool. So I just want to rewind that a little bit. I'm curious about what experience did you have in the military that made you change your mind about actually deciding to go to Georgia to go to college? Okay, well, um, when I was in the Navy, probably the most defining moment, I was on an aircraft carrier, Theodore Roosevelt, and the ship had a, a library. The library wasn't any bigger than this room here. It was a small place, but they had a book in there called After Hours by Edwin Torres. I picked up that book and um, and I started to read it. It was the first time I was, it's the first time I read a book without being assigned by a teacher. So that got me interested in literature. And then off the ship, I was stationed in Norfolk. I used to go visit my friends at Norfolk State, people I went to high school with, and at Hampton University. So that got me interested in uh, HBCUs. So, um, that's when my father at the time, he was a pastor in Savannah, Georgia. And he told me about Savannah State, uh, which is also a historically black college and university. So I said, well, I'll try to go to Savannah State. So I decided to go down there. And it was a chance for me to be with my be with my father because uh, my parents divorced when I was like three years old and uh he had lived in Georgia for a long time. So I, I only saw him sporadically. So that was a chance to go to Georgia, be closer to him, get to know him a little bit better, and go to an HBCU. And it was a great experience. I loved it. What are some influential moments in your life? Probably the most uh, influential moment in my life would be my experiences, my experiences or decisions to go into the Navy before I went to college was very uh, influential in that the, the people that I met along the way, the relationships and the people that I connected with um, really helped my decision in terms of going to school also, my father, my father, uh, being an educated man himself, 
um, and he felt and still feels that education is very important. He influenced me because, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, like some sons, I wanted to please my father. I wanted to, I wanted him to be proud of me. Uh, so he played a big role in that. Even with my decision to further my education at my age now, you know, my father would uh, encourage that. You know, he would ask questions like, uh, have you thought about, you know, those would be the start of the sentence. Have you thought about getting your doctorate, you know, and things like that. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's things that I've thought about, but, you know, I, I've just, for whatever reason, I didn't make that decision until I guess it was my time. I could have done it earlier because I, I, I got my master's in 2001. I could have done it a long time ago, but I didn't get that um, that feeling, that unction to do it at that time. So I guess it, I guess it was all done in the right order, the right time. I like to think so. Otherwise, I've, I've wasted a lot of years. <laughs> no, I definitely don't think that you wasted a lot of years. So let's go back and tell me about your first teaching assignment in 1998. Okay. Well, in 1998, I decided that I wanted to give back. It was all about giving back to my community in Southeast Washington, D.C. Um, but I was reluctant. I didn't want to just jump into the classroom because I felt like I didn't have the teaching experience. So I decided to start with uh, Sylvan, Sylvan Learning Center. Uh, they had a contract with D.C. Public Schools at the time. So um, I signed up with that and I was um, placed at Stanton, um, elementary school in Southeast, off, off, uh, right off Alabama Avenue in that area, <clears throat> which is just about the neighborhood I grew up in, but, you know, a little bit different, but I still had family over there as well. So bad neighborhood, you know, mm. uh, and everything else, and it had all the problems that come with that type of environment, and so did the children who came into that, you know, into my Sylvan classroom. So that was like my sort of introduction to teaching. And it, I felt like if I can do this, then perhaps I could further go on and get into a classroom, which I did the next year uh, at a middle school in DC. So what was it about that experience at the Sylvan Learning? What may, reached in there and grabbed you and said, gee, I wanna do this and gee, I might like to be an elementary school teacher or well, I started off with the little ones first, I felt like, because I felt like they would be easier to deal with, and then I could sort of feel my way. So the the very next year, I went in, I went to middle school and said, well, let me see how that works out, you know. Uh, so then I found my sort of, you know, what level I should work with. And at that point, I decided it should be secondary education, so the older kids, so... Um, so when I finally decided to go and get my master's, uh, that following, that same year, actually, I concentrated on secondary education in English. Um, so that influenced my decision. I didn't know. I, I, I don't think at that point I knew that I was going to be teaching like I felt like I was going to be teaching forever, I guess. I don't know. Um, I didn't know that until uh, a couple of years later when I went back. I, I did a, um, a contract as a writer for the federal government. I was with uh, Office of Disaster Assistance. I did that for like two years, a contract. After the contract ended, I decided I'd go, I would go back into teaching. And so I went to... Um, Prince George's Community College, because then at that point I decided, well, let me try the college level and see how that is. And uh, that was my first experience teaching at Prince George's Community College. Again, giving back to my neighborhood, my demographic, because I was from that area as well. Um, and then after that, after being married, I decided we move out to Montgomery County. And on the bus one day, I'm passing through on a bus and passing through campus. And then, you know, you know, it came to me, why don't I try Montgomery College? 
and I guess a couple of months later, um, I got a call to come in, and I started teaching here part time. That was in two thousand and eleven. I started, yeah. So uh, that was the beginning of my decision, where I said to myself, you know what, this is what I was meant to do, and I'm. This is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to develop it and become as good at it as possible, you know. And we're certainly glad to have you here. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. So how have your experiences, all these experiences that you've had, going from tutoring to K-12 to to doing, I suppose, adjuncting work, how have these experiences and your background perspective shaped your views on what you do in the classroom and teaching and learning? Oh, yeah. Um, Well, my background, it's funny because you see it all sort of connecting, you know, when you reflect back on it, because I did radio. I did radio for four years, and I did theater when I was in high school and college. And of course, in theater, they tell you to project and they teach you how to, you know, face the audience and all that kind of stuff. And when I got on radio, the one thing that I had to do is I had to get rid of my D.C. accent. So there were certain things I would say, you know, without even thinking, you know, because we take we we replace the T.H. with a V, you know, with brother. We say brother, Mm -hmm. mother, father Mm -hmm. or whatever the case. And we say it. And we say it proper, you know, it doesn't matter how you say it, but we just say it, you know. So I had to tape myself. I would tape, record myself, listen, and then correct it. So I did that in terms of language to the point that people can't really tell where I'm from. They have to ask me, right? Because my where I've lived and what I've done has sort of shaped my, um, my language in my perspective and um, and I thought at first before I went into education I went back to Howard I thought I was going to get into English <clears throat> but I spoke to the English department I spoke to the sociology department um, because I was interested in um, sort of the development of human beings and what have you right and I was also interested in anthropology mm-hmm. I went to a uh, a weekend uh, retreat at American University one year. It was like in the late 90s, early 2000. Mm-hmm. And um, it was for anthropology, for public anthropology. And finally, they went around the table and they asked everyone, you know, so uh, what is your sort of perspective on anthropology and how do you, how are you going to use it in your profession? Because everybody there was, they were, uh, you know, anthropology majors mm-hmm. you know, or teaching anthropology. So anyway, they got to me and they say, uh, what is your name, sir? And I said, you know, Stephen Best. And they said, so what do you plan to do with anthropology and so forth? I said, well, I'm not a, a, a student. Oh, do you teach you? No, and I don't, I don't teach it at all. And so they finally said, so what are you doing here? I said, I was interested mm-hmm. in anthropology and I just wanted, I thought it'd be fun. <laughs> and they were kind of looking at me like, okay, that's fine. But um, so fast forward, when I, con- when I got into my doctorate, you know, m- my doctoral program at Northeastern, I, um, I wanted to, my focus, of course, is education and curriculum. But my focus ended up being uh, culturally responsive teaching hmm. and how all of that connects with sociology because I read a lot of books on sociology that are connected to education and of course a little bit about anthropology and of course literature so I combine all of that in my research and put it all together when I'm doing my papers and my research and everything else so as I reflect back on that in terms of my background all of that is sort of interconnected and then of course when I'm in the classroom and I can't forget history too history also played a part just learning history. Because when I'm in the classroom, uh, and we're talking about different subjects, you know, sociology comes up, education comes up, history comes up, because we connect it all with the, the literature. 
And, uh, and I tell students all the time that all of that is interconnected. And to better understand the literature, we have to understand the history and understand the people and understand the language. Right. And the context, the times in which a lot of the things were written. Exactly. Because a lot of students, because it's so diverse, a lot of students are uh, foreign born. <clears throat> they don't know very much about American history and they especially don't know much about African-American history uh, or even Native American history. So we talk about those things and I, I teach them because they don't know. Because if you let them tell it, you know, uh, you know, African-Americans were slaves in the 1940s or something or 50s. Right. So you have to <laughs> you have to really right. talk about it and break it down and say, OK, right. no, that wasn't going on then. What was going on then? Right. You know, and as and related to this literature that we're reading, what was going on in this time period? You know, how did that uh, shape the character's perspective? How did that uh, play a part in the story itself or the outcome of the story? So we talk about all of that. Right. That sounds like a very, very interesting class that I would like to be a part of. We have a lot of discussions offline mm -hmm. about the kinds of things you do in your classroom and the kind of readings that you have. Yeah. And it just yeah. sounds like a really, really rich and interesting class, especially from the uh, a subject that we are both very passionate about, the African-American history standpoint. Yes, yes. And we talk about that. And, and, and like you and I talk about the music, too. I talk about the music. What was the music of that time? What was the, uh, how did the public, general public perceive that music? You know, stuff like that. So we, you know, I have a good time with it. And, you know, I, I tell them all the time, I'm, I'm having a great time. I love to teach. And, and hopefully, you know, some of that will rub off on you. And hopefully, <laughs> you know, otherwise I'm having a good time. Right. And that's the you student know. engagement piece. Yes. If you are engaged in it, you mm -hmm. will likely be able to pull them into it. Yes, and that's always my hope. So while we're on the subject of the kinds of experiences you pull into the classroom from that multidisciplinary approach, what has been your favorite lesson that you teach? Well, I teach, I teach 102 every semester. And uh, although I try to switch it up a little bit and you know come up with something fresh, I always go back to... Um, the civil rights movement, and especially as it pertains to Dr. King and uh, Malcolm X, and of course I connect that with the late 50s. I talk about the events that led up to it, and we focus on the letter from Birmingham jail. Well, anyway, I, I, I sort of tie that in not only with, not only with the music, not only with the history, but I like to connect a film with it if I have time in the semester. So it's always about if I have the time. But there's a, a, a film uh, called The Great Debaters, which, of course, is uh, told from a historical perspective, true story, you know, and about Wiley College. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's sort of sharing who I am in a, in, a, in a sense because, you know, Wiley College is this uh, uh, historically black college in Wiley, Texas, and still exists to this day, you know, so my own experience and just sharing with the students what that is all about, you know, what is an HBCU? Um, what was, how does that tie in with Dr. King? Because he went to uh, Morehouse. Mm -hmm. um, how does that tie in with the civil rights movement? Uh, so I, I sort of tie, it's, it's sort of my way of teaching the students about that experience, that American experience that you know many of them just don't know about. Uh, most of the stuff that they know about pertaining to African American life and culture typically has to do with music, right? Or something pertaining to, unfortunately, something negative. So, I feel like um, someone who has had the experiences that I've had. Uh, part of my teaching responsibility is to, you know, teach them about my experiences and, mm -hmm. and how, uh, how that plays into the literature and everything else and how that plays into what I teach in the classroom because mm -hmm. I was sharing that with them today. I said, you know, I was an English major 
I said, I've heard students complain that, you know, uh, I talk too much about um, African-American history and culture mm -hmm. in the class. And I said, the reason I talk about that is because that was my focus in college. I was an English major focusing on African-American and African literature. So I talk mm -hmm. about what I know about. I said, if you go to another professor, their focus was British literature or it was mm -hmm. Irish literature. They're going to talk some about that because that was their focus. That's what they know more about. I said, uh, so that's the important um, thing you should know that I'm going to teach about what I know about. <laughs> right. And yeah. by having those different professors with those different perspectives, that's how you learn about the unique American or even the world experience. That's right. You have to be exposed to all of those different lenses, our mm. lens and, and other people's lenses. That's right. That's right. Because, um, you know, because that, that conversation also led to, uh, you know, uh, talks in terms of global, the global perspective. Because many of them didn't know, for instance, that those people who are in the Caribbean and those people who are in places like Brazil, uh, those are people I like to call my, uh, my cultural cousins. Right. Uh, because when you look at the DNA over time, I know because I'm on Ancestry and everything, so I look at that, and when I type in a destination, it comes up with distant cousins who live in Latin America, who live in Jamaica, who you know live in certain parts of the Americas, who are my fifth to eighth cousin. Right. And that's not by chance. That's because we are all interconnected. Yes. We are all part of the same people who came out of West Africa. Right. And who came out of Europe. Can't forget Europe. Right. Um, because some of those cousins are European with no African ancestry. Right. Yeah. So um, I talk about that. I talk about that in classroom. Sometimes I, I try not to be too transparent. and <laughs> But at the same time, I, I want them to know who I am and my background a bit just to give them, just to let them know that just because I grew up in an environment at the beginning of my life in housing projects of Washington, D.C., that doesn't dictate who I will become and or who I am. And I feel like if that if that inspires one student to say I can do it, too, then that's that's fine. If it can inspire a whole lot of them, that's even better. But that's why I do. That's why I share it. I think that's great. I think that's that's great. And I think that's part of the noble goals of the college. Yeah. It's part of the mission of, of what we do as a community college. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So since we're on the subject of you wanting to have an impact on your students, can you think of a teacher that you had when you were school aged or even at the college level that had uh, influence on you or your teaching style? Hmm. Well, the influence on me as a teacher I have to go back to elementary school in D.C., Washington Highland Elementary, uh, which is now closed because the neighborhood around it was demolished. But um, it was Mr. Mr. Dyson. He was the only male teacher besides the gym teacher. <laughs> it was Mr. Dyson who taught, you know, uh, everything uh, from English to math and everything else. Um, but I saw him as a male figure. He was the he was the person we looked up to um, as a strong male figure in a uh, community that was entirely African American, um, and he himself was African American. And just a, he was just a, a positive role model. So that was the one person I remember looking up to. Because like I said, my, my parents had divorced when I was three. And my father had moved to Georgia, so I didn't see him very often. So to have Mr. Dyson and to see him, it was that sort of father figure, that positive role model that I could look up to. Uh, because my father at the time was not around. Uh, when I got to the college level, I remember Dr. Waters, Dr. Carver Waters, he was uh, he influenced my teaching style. He didn't influence much else because he, he used to come to class. I don't care what what 
season it was. He would come with these corduroys <laughs> and these brown sort of comfortable looking shoes that he never put polish on, but they looked comfortable. They did look comfortable. <laughs> and he would come every day like that and he had this scraggly beard. But he would he was passionate about literature and in class discussions when we would give our answers and everything like that, he he was he he always let us know that our answers and our perspectives were important. And that influenced me a great deal. I was very impressed with that because I felt like, you know, he was a teacher, he's a professor, he's teaching us, and it seems like he's learning from us. So I, I make sure that I convey that to my students, you know, today, that I can learn from you. I want to hear your perspective on things. I want to hear what you have to say. And sometimes it's true. They say some stuff. I'm like, wow, that's good. That's really good. <laughs> and um, and I let them know that. And I let the and I let the class know that because my whole thing is I'm I'm all about building, empowering. That's what I want to do. When you come into my classroom, that's my goal. I'm going to build you up um, as much as I can in the time that I have. Sounds like an awesome experience to be a part of. Yeah. How do you think your past classroom experiences have impacted your views on teaching and learning? Well, when I think about that, I think about my first experiences teaching uh, middle school. And it was, you know, the, the kids in that school, they were primarily from the neighborhood that I grew up in. So, I, you know, it, I took a sort of parental approach, I think, uh, which I, I don't think was the right approach because I would often at times, you know, lecture them in the middle of when I'm supposed to be teaching them, uh, tell them about themselves, what they need to do and all these sorts of things. And sometimes because I was so passionate about them, because I, 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 you know, I genuinely, I think I loved them because they were, you know, I felt like these are my people from my community. So I, I got a little bit overzealous at times. So I, I had to learn to, um, for one, not look at their experiences as so much my experiences. Yeah, we have a similar background, but they have different experiences and different perspectives and everything. And they went through things sometimes that I probably couldn't imagine, you know. <clears throat> so I had to look at them individually. And I had to think more before I, I spoke to them. And I had to, uh, when I reflect back on it, you know. And I, when I, when I fast forward to this point, I'm very careful in what I say to students because I know these are things that they remember for a lifetime. So sometimes when you're when you when you're lecturing them and telling them what they shouldn't do and should not do or whatever the case, sometimes things might slip out <laughs> that you don't intend to say or, or don't intend to convey. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it really caused me to, you know, weigh and measure my words very carefully of what I say and how I say it. Um, and I think it's given me a reputation now, you know. A lot of times now they, they think of me as a, they think I'm humorous and things like, they think I'm funny and things like that because I'm able to, you know, just be myself and my own personality. But I'm also not lecturing them. So uh, that helps out too. So uh, when I'm able to talk to them or I, I want them to learn something from this conversation or what have you, you know, I'm just very careful of how I say it, you know, and what is said. But so that influenced a lot of my, uh, the way I, I guess I would pertain mostly to classroom management. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so interesting that you say this because I have done probably 10 or more of these interviews now. And a lot of times when I ask that question, people, they do, they get that kind of viewpoint. They'll say that. They will mm -hmm. say that you know, they regret sometimes being so strict, being so hard on the students, um, not being, you know, as empathetic as they could be. Yeah. And it must be something because, I mean, even like when you're a new employee, when you're new to the job and you're young and you're fresh and you're green, you do things so strictly according to 
protocol, not really realizing that there might be a lot of human elements, human factors you have to be considering yeah. because you want to do a good job, mm -hmm. you know, you want to be respected. And then I guess after time goes along, you can kind of feel the rhythm of where you need to be at, where you can still, you know, command the respect that you need, but still yeah. be a human and be approachable. Oh, yeah. Seems to be a theme with the faculty. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Are there any classroom activities or practices that you strongly believe in? Well, one of the things I tell students as soon as they come into my classroom is that um, it's heavily, you know, discussion based. Um, I like to talk. I like to talk to the students. I like to discuss what we've read. Um, I like to hear their perspectives on things. Um, and that's all to build, you know, critical thinking skills. And it kind of goes back to what I was saying about building um, and empowering. I want them to know or at least get to the point in knowing that their ideas, what they think is important and is relevant mm -hmm. and is uh, intelligent, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of times they don't have that opportunity. If they get in front of somebody who is just, you know, sort of talking to them. Mm -hmm. And they're not involved and, not, and they're just taking notes and things like that. Mm -hmm. But when they can learn to have dialogue and to go back and forth with someone uh, who is, you know, the facilitator, that's what I'm trying to get them to the point in doing. So that's very, very, very important to me. And you're building job skills in those students in doing that. Yes. You're preparing them for careers. Yes, and how to talk and communicate. Um, and I tell them that all the time. You know, it's, it, communication is very important. You have to learn how to communicate. And sometimes when they're giving their answers, they lower their voices. And I have to stretch my ear and I tell them, look, I have very good ears. I've been to the doctor. I've checked. I know they're <laughs> good ears. So you need to talk. You need to turn it up a little bit. And I tell them, I said, I want you to be confident in your answer. I want you to say it again, but I want you to say it with confidence because it's correct. What you said is correct, but I need you—I need you to say that with confidence. And I also need you to say with confidence if you don't know something that you don't know, confidently. I don't know. Right, right. <laughs> Building that self-esteem in them too, because exactly for a lot of them, it's, that's important, mm -hmm. and they might not have had that. That even ties in with the um, elite um, conference that we had earlier about students and them having uh, positive experiences in school, the keynote mm -hmm. speaker and what she talked about, mm -hmm. you might be their really first positive experience with being able to express themselves, being mm -hmm. able to communicate with them, so having self-esteem and not feeling ridiculed. Yes. And that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think is the most important thing to consider when engaging students? Um, well, that's, that's one of the things I'm studying because I'm looking at culturally responsive teaching. And uh, if, if you consider their background, for instance, um, I think that's very important. I had a, a student in my class who was, I had a few of them at that semester who were from Vietnam. And we were looking at a story, uh, the story, The Things They Carried uh, by Tim O'Brien. And of course, when you talk about Vietnam and in the United States, it's mostly focused on war, the Vietnam War. So I decided to find this poem. And the poem was talking about nature and everything, sort of like uh, sort of the, the theme of Asian poems uh, at times. But I had a student read this poem in Vietnamese because I wanted to hear the language spoken in a poetic form and I wanted the students to hear the language spoken and then and luckily the student who was reading it it was slightly older student you know so he was more than happy to do it uh, but it gave a really interesting perspective because oftentimes when we hear language we hear it in passing and we don't think about it but when you can see the English translation because that's what the students had in hand and you can hear it being read in Vietnamese and being explained from that student's perspective. You know, that I think that uh, 
is important because for one, it, it, it makes the student feel like they are part of the class, even though they're from Vietnam and they're in the classroom in Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, and so I think the background um, and the cultural perspective is very important to, thing to consider for students. So what would be your favorite moment in the classroom? My favorite moment is when we're having a discussion and the students become so engaged that while one is speaking, the other one is raising his or her hand and the discussion is really just electric. I mean, where not only are they learning, but I'm learning is taking place with me as well. I mean, I'm learning so much from what I'm hearing from the students, from their varied backgrounds and their varied perspectives. Um, whenever that occurs, and unfortunately it does not occur every class, <laughs> but whenever that does occur, you know, that's like my, my favorite moment in teaching. I think it would be a Herculean task to get that going every time. I think the fact that you've got it going some of the time means you're on the right track. Yeah, yeah. I suppose I suppose it won't be you know it wouldn't be special if it was every time. So, you know, when it happens, it's a treat. It really is. Were you good at English when you were younger? The subject you teach. I um. I became good at English because I was when I went. I was sent to high school in North Carolina uh, from D.C. public schools because, you know, to keep out of trouble. So my mother, my parents, they sent me, they agreed that I would go live with my father's parents in North Carolina. And when I got down there, um, English was my best class. I did well in English. I don't know why I did. My And the town was small. So my English teacher was Miss Cherry, Linda Cherry, who was also my cousin. <laughs> Because, <laughs> you know, that's how it is in those small towns. And um, so Miss Cherry, we would read different stories and everything like that. But probably my biggest motivator in terms of English was my high school girlfriend. She was in the um, honors English class. And I wanted to be in the class with her. So... <laughs> I made sure I did well enough to get in the class. And, I, and this is before I was dating her in high school. And I remember um, when I first got in that class, I was sitting to the left of her. And this was like 1984, something like that. But I asked, could I borrow a pen? And I remember she gave me that pen. And I remember she told me I could keep that pen. And I remember how happy I was, you know. I didn't do anything strange with the pen, but I was very happy to own it. <laughs> and, um, and 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 the funny thing is, we're still friends to this day. She turned out to be a judge. She's a judge in North Carolina, and she has a, a big family and everything. She got married and had a big family, but that influenced my path. It's funny how you know these little life events sort of steer you in the direction that you should go in. But that had a huge part and why I became an English major, because when I got out of the Navy and went to college, um, I chose English as a major because I felt like that was the one thing that was going to get me out of college, like graduate. I said, I know I can do that. So it wasn't about the job, it was more about, okay, I need to graduate. That's interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this interview with us today, Stephen. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Michelle. I really enjoyed it, too. Uh, the conversation, uh, the reflection, because I talked about some things that I didn't know that I was going to talk about. So it really helped me to really put together my thoughts and ideas about why I love teaching so much. Thank you. Thank you.